Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, October 14th Pullman Police Advisory Committee. I am Stephanie Rink, the chair of the committee. So thank you for joining us. We are going to start our meeting with the roll call. If you can please start us off. David Macon, I'm the representative for the multicultural community members. Isabella Macon, former high school representative. Amir al Bakshi, a GPS site of Brazil. Angela Brown, multicultural. Angela Center, WC faculty staff. Stephanie Ring, chair, and I'm also the Pullman School District parent. Eric Tetzloff, business representative. Phyllis Stahlkopp, Sunnyside Hill. Adam Williams, Sunnyside Hill. Gary Jenkins, police chief. Darby Baldwin, police admin assistant. Karen Brashears, police sergeant, Pullman PD. Wonderful, thank you. So we will go forward with the approval of minutes. Do we have quorum? I think we do. We, do not. Dark, we no. don't? Not yet. How many okay. do we need? We'll be hopeful. We need two. Because we have eight representatives. Well, while I, we're doing that, does anybody have, I know everyone read the minutes and are well versed in all of everything. So does anybody have any edits, concerns, comments, questions? No? Okay. I would say no count yet, so I think we need seven. Seven, we do. All right. Yep. Just leave it. Wonderful. Okay. So for the approval of minutes, do we have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. All right, all those in favor to approve the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, approve the minutes. So next order of business, we have the firearms law presentation by Sergeant Aaron Bruchars. Thank you for coming and visiting with us today. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be here. I thank all of you for being here as well. So uh, my goal in presenting this information to you is to keep you from falling asleep, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> Some of the, you know, if just reading uh, Revised Code of Washington laws to you verbatim is not a very effective way for you to learn anything, and it's pretty boring and pretty dry. So I've tried to condense some of this down and make it palatable, if possible. Okay? So uh, my objectives for the day, to give you a brief overview of applicable laws in the state of Washington, a brief overview of the new laws that may be affecting citizens in the state of Washington, and uh, talk about some of the competing interests that affect the way that these laws have come out, um, including some of the, the referendums and the initiatives. Okay. So we'll start out with, in the beginning, uh, there were no laws. So the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights and the Second Amendment, you know, very clearly came out, um, and the, the, the founding forefathers established that Second Amendment to ensure that there were some, at least a grounding point for laws. And this is be one of the few things that I'm going to read to you verbatim. A well-regulated militia being necessary to secure a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that was ratified in 1791. So that is really the first kind of constraint as far as laws go. And it really wasn't a constraint, it was a, a declaration of a right. And if you move down through U.S. history, really the first control or restriction on firearms was the 1934 National Firearms Act. And that act was in response to a lot of crime that was occurring. There was a lot of high-profile um, robberies and murders that were occurring. If you remember the, the John Dillinger gang and Thompson machine guns and uh, those types of gangster activities. There also was a very high profile um, mass murder that occurred in Chicago. Um, the Valentine's Day massacre, essentially some gangsters mowed down a whole bunch of other gangsters and very high profile. It was uh, essentially the, the, the politicians and society at the time said, okay, we're going to move forward and we're going to make some restrictions on this because of how it is affecting society. So the National Firearms Act, essentially what it did is it imposed a tax. It didn't eliminate full automatic weapons or 
sawed-off shotguns or short-barreled rifles or anything like that, it imposed a tax on them. And it required that those particular restricted items be registered and pay that tax. And in 1934, the tax was $200. In today's terms, that would be $3,832, wow. um, given inflation. So essentially, their, their, their plan was, whether they um, freely admitted it or not, was to essentially make the tax so high that owning them would be prohibitive for an average citizen. And so there were some you know, grandfather rules that came into place. If you already owned them prior to 1934, you weren't required to register them or pay the tax. But if you came into possession of them after 1934 or they were transferred to another citizen, that tax had to be paid. And essentially what it did is over a long period of time, and there, was, there were additions and changes to that act over the years. But that is the, the beginning of it. What it did over the years is it, it did what it was intended to do. It really greatly restricted um, people buying automatic weapons. Because at the time when this was passed, the Thompson um, machine gun was extremely uh, prevalent at the time as far as getting into uh, organized crime. It was expensive at the time because it was a complicated gun to make, but by adding a essentially almost a $4,000 tax to it, people didn't buy them. Um, capitalism took place, no, I'm not buying that, I'm not going to spend the money on it, so that's what happened, nobody bought them. Um, or legally bought them unless you were wealthy. So as we uh, progress on, there were some changes in uh, 1968. Um, there were some very high profile assassinations. There were some restrictions that were placed there that started to require background checks, serial numbers on firearms. And these are all federal laws, which are applicable within the state as well. Um, moving on to the next really big federal law was the, in 1986. This is the Firearm Owners Protection Act. And this is where I'll kind of mix in those competing interests that when we talk about firearms laws. There are strong proponents of firearms and firearm ownership and treating them as a right. There is another competing interest that doesn't believe that it is a right and that people should not have them for their reasons. What happened in the Firearms Owner Protection Act, and this is again after more high profile events occurred, this was uh, shortly after um, the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. The, the laws that they enacted here didn't really affect any of the firearm, the firearm that was used in that assassination attempt. That assassination attempt was a revolver. You know, it's been around, that design's been around for, at that point, 120 years or so. What the Firearm Owners Protection Act did do was eliminate machine guns. Essentially, it said that um, you could not lawfully possess a machine gun that was manufactured after 1986. So a civilian could not go and buy a machine gun, even if they wanted to pay the tax, they could not go and buy that machine gun um, if it was manufactured after, after 1986. Competing interests. The competing interests were not going to sign off on a bill like that. What ended up happening, the competing interests were able to get within the Firearms Owner Protection Act, essentially a subpart that essentially made it illegal for the government to create a national registry of firearms. So competing interests. We're going to outlaw machine guns, but we're not going to keep records of who owns firearms um, because they're still looking at it as a right. And as we move on, this, this competing interest is really important in considering firearms because you know, it, it goes along with what is happening in your society at the time. You know, what are the politicians doing? Are the courts there kind of mitigating the, the emotional outbursts of the crowd, essentially? And you know, there's a, a right somewhere in there that the court is going to protect, but not going to override the, the common interest of the public. So as these certain people were being prosecuted for certain gun crimes, as guns began to become more restricted in some of the cities, Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, places like that. In 2008, the Supreme Court had a 
it's essentially a landmark case as far as firearms go. In 2008, they proclaimed that the Second Amendment established an individual right for U.S. citizens to possess firearms. So that's a pretty landmark case. And because of that, it's some of these uh, inner cities that had very restrictive firearms possession laws. Essentially, they were ruled unconstitutional. You cannot restrict an individual's right to own firearms. On the flip side, the Supreme Court has been very hesitant to hear very many firearms cases. So they did this case. Traditionally, what happens when the Supreme Court hears a particular issue, they will make a decision in a landmark case, and then they'll hear a series of other cases that are potentially related to that issue, and they'll spell out some very clear direction for the courts and for law enforcement and for the public to know, you know, where is this all going to wash out? Um, there's, you know, the, essentially they didn't do that in this case. They have heard no cases since 2008 regarding um, the Second Amendment specifically. There are some new cases that I've heard that are going to be scheduled for the 2019, well, actually it's 2020 docket, where they're going to go in and talk about some of the specific um, restrictions or maybe not restrictions, maybe rights, but they're going to clarify some of the, the details and how they see it regarding firearms possession. So as you can see, the, the competing rights when it comes to firearm laws keeps coming up. People that want restrictions, people that don't believe there are restrictions, and there's the courts and the legislature, they all meet somewhere in the middle and come up with something that's hopefully palatable for the whole society. In Washington, the Washington Constitution was ratified in um, 1889. The Washington Constitution went even further than the U.S. Constitution in its specific details of what they considered to be a right to bear arms. And so they specifically said, the right of the individual citizen to bear arms in defense of himself or the state shall not be impaired. So that's, that goes even farther than what the U.S. Constitution did. As a result of you know having U.S. law and Washington um, law, or essentially from a Supreme Court level and from a constitutional level, we start to get smaller laws put in place by the legislature that start restricting some of these rights a little bit but are not necessarily overturned in the court setting because <coughs> from a Supreme Court standpoint, they aren't necessarily required to hear a case. They could just choose not to listen to the case and the, the status quo shall remain. So some of the longstanding wa laws in Washington regarding firearms possession or use, these are some that have been in place for um, years. Um, specifically, um, you cannot possess a firearm in the state of Washington if you are a convicted felon, if you're found to be criminally insane, if you are convicted of a domestic violence crime, if there is a court order. And under the court order, they essentially uh, have put in quotations a credible threat while awaiting trial. And so where this would come into place is if someone is arrested for a serious crime, a felony, a domestic violence crime, the court can issue conditions that say, you shall not possess a firearm while you're awaiting trial. And that, that has been a long-standing Washington law and it has, been, um, has not been overturned. Another area of, of specific restriction in Washington is involuntarily committed for mental health treatment. So if you've been involuntarily committed for mental health treatment, that um, prohibits you from possessing a firearm. And if you're under the age of 18, you're prohibited from possessing a firearm, except this is we're coming back to our competing interests again. So they said, you can't possess a firearm if you're under the age of 18, unless, and there's a whole bunch of exceptions here for if you're under the age of 18 to possess. It's a hunter safety course. You're target shooting at an established range. You're involved in a competition. You're hunting. You have a valid license for hunting. Um, let's see. You are required to have a valid hunter safety certificate while you're hunting. If you're traveling to or from any of the above described activities, or if you're on private property and you're under, that's under the control of a parent or guardian, or you're at your personal residence, or you're a member of the armed forces. So these competing interests, you can't possess them, but here's a whole bunch of exceptions, which there's 
very few things that I can look at here that you couldn't do with all those exceptions if you're under the age of 18, um, except maybe walk down the street because you're not hunting, unless you're going to and from a hunting or competition, etc. So competing interests kind of uh, affect how the, app, the law can be applicable. Um, there are some unlawful firearms um, in, that are governed under Washington law as well as under federal law. And specifically, it's illegal in Washington to manufacture, own, buy, sell, loan, furnish a machine gun, a short barreled shotgun, or a short barreled rifle. And they've recently added the bump fire stocks. If you recall from the Las Vegas shooting, a bump fire stock was used there. So that was added, the law was updated and added that as well because it was um, prohibited federally. So again, our competing interests. We've outlawed all of these things, except there's exceptions. It's not unlawful to do all of those things um, if you're in compliance with applicable federal law. So in Washington, the law says that you can't have a short-barreled rifle, a short-barreled shotgun, a machine gun. But if you can do it legally under federal law, then they're going to allow you to do it. And how you would do it legally under federal law, you would pay the, the national, you would pay a $200 tax to possess one of those guns. That's, that was established back in 1934 with the National Firearms Act. So the competing interests, there's some push here and push here and you kind of end up with something in the middle. One item that is, the laws in Washington and federally regarding firearms are pretty complex and so we're doing a, an overview and we're not gonna be able to hit every single thing tonight. We could, this it would take a long time to hit every law and, and go into great detail. But something that I want you guys to consider is how many exceptions end up popping up and applying under certain circumstances. Regarding machine guns, that law clearly says that you can't possess them in Washington. Well, there's another exception for that. If you possessed it prior to 1986, then you can possess it. So there's always an exception in there. Um, moving down to more restrictions that are in Washington. You cannot possess a device for suppressing the noise of any firearm except unless it's legally registered under federal law and you pay the National Firearms Act $200 tax stamp. So essentially suppressors are illegal unless it's legal under federal law. There is um, another exception regarding um, possession of a firearm and it specifically is um, applied to juvenile possession of a firearm and that's when you're using it to use a lawful use of force. So if a juvenile is using force lawfully and what they describe as a lawful use of force regarding this law is acting under an officer's direction necessarily used by a person arresting one who has committed a felony or delivering him or her to a public officer competent to receive him or if you're about to be injured this is where you would consider the self-defense argument and preventing an offense against another so Force can also be used by any person to prevent a mentally ill or mentally incompetent or mentally disabled person from committing an act dangerous to any person. Okay. So as we kind of move through these laws, we'll, we'll try to keep in mind uh, how they're going to affect you know, an average citizen and how they can be applied. So there's a law in place that says that you cannot carry a concealed pistol unless you do the following. You have to uh, go through a background check. And under Washington law, again, the competing interests kick in here. Uh, the Washington law says that if you file an application to get a concealed pistol license, the chief of police of a municipal municipality or the sheriff of a county shall within 30 days after filing the application of any person issue the license to that person. So this is getting back to under Washington law it being a right. So the chief of police does not have the authority to deny the application um, for the concealed pistol license unless 
there are some other violations that occur. And some of those other violations are domestic violence convictions, you're under the age of 21, convicted felon, um, anything that makes you prohibited from possessing a firearm. So in, in today's day and age, there has been a great concern over people possessing firearms and using them to do acts of evil. And there have been some changes in the, in the Washington law, and we're going to go over those specific changes in Washington law that kind of affect this a little bit. So the pamphlet that I'm handing out to you right now is a document that was put out by the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. And they go over the new laws that have been put into place in the state of Washington um, covering the last election. Um, and if you guys recall, there were a initiative I-639, I-6, excuse me, I-1639 uh, put in some, uh, some changes into Washington law and made some requirements upon law enforcement, and we're going to go over those um, right now. These are the very new specific changes. So one of the biggest changes that they made um, in reaction to things that were happening in society is the, rest the restriction of semi-automatic rifles. And under the Washington law, the change they gave them the terminology of an SARS, which is a semi-automatic assault rifle, and it was defined by RCW. And essentially, they said that persons from under the age of 21 cannot purchase a semi-automatic rifle. If they're going to possess the semi-automatic rifle and they're under the age of 21, there are some exceptions. Again, it goes back to some of those exceptions we talked about earlier, hunting, transporting, private property, um, competing. Um, and the, and the, in the process of the transportation, the firearm cannot be loaded. <coughs> Another change that was put into place is regarding background checks. And this is where Washington law and federal law kind of uh, start to bump into each other a little bit on the background checks. Whenever someone purchases a firearm, um, they're required to go through a background check. And that background check is, it used to be almost exclusively submitted to the FBI um, and through what's called a NICS processing. And that's the, the national, uh, let me look it up here what that stands for. National Instant Criminal Background Check System. That's it right there. So that used to go exclusively through the FBI. Well, the FBI un coincidentally announced this year that they were going to stop doing that. So that responsibility has shifted to local law enforcement. And kind of in a process of how that might actually work is if you went to go and purchase a firearm, you would fill out an application, and we'll talk about that real quick here. So you would fill out an application and what's called a federal firearm transfer record, which is form 4473 that the ATF issues. And within that form, there's a whole series of questions. And the questions are, are you a convicted felon? Are you under the influence of alcohol or drugs? Um, are you convicted of domestic violence? Have you ever renounced your citizenship? Um, were you? Um, dishonorably discharged from the military. There's a series of questions that they ask that can, uh, where they can then deny you the ability to buy the firearm. If you pass all of those or, or answer all of those correctly and you complete your information and you provide a government issued photographic identification at the time, that check would be submitted and they would essentially look up your name through a, a criminal background check to see whether you lied on the form. And if you did not lie on the form and you're not a convicted felon, um, that they can show. And th this is where the law and reality may not be uh, on the same page. So what shows up on this, uh, this conviction record 
um, may not show arrests. Because just because you were arrested for something doesn't mean that you were convicted. Um, you could be arrested for a felony crime and then have that crime either dismissed due to lack of evidence or potentially take a plea deal for a misdemeanor crime in lieu of a felony. And so there, there are some, some changes that can happen um, within the, the court process itself that have a direct impact on this. Once that, uh, since the FBI no longer does it, local law enforcement is the one who is required to do those checks. <coughs> New laws put in place. Local law enforcement now does, and it's probably a little more accurate to do at a local level because we have local criminal records for people who live here who may not have been convicted of something, but if they make an application and we can know, oh, this person has been involuntarily committed for mental health reasons more than one time, then we can look further and find out whether or not they meet that criteria of being and, and just taken to the hospital by the police department is not necessarily mean that you have been involuntarily committed. Um, when they say involuntarily committed, they're more specifically referring to being committed to a, a mental health institution for more than just being taken to the hospital. So Eastern State Mental Hospital or some of the other um, inpatient treatment centers in Spokane would qualify under that area. So hopefully local law enforcement would have that information and be able to refer back and go, no, we're not going to approve that purchase because we have knowledge that this has occurred. And this is some of what has occurred in the, the new laws. Um, once that instant criminal background check goes out, comes back to local law enforcement, essentially they will provide the the dealer who's selling the firearm, if it's going through the proper channels, with one of three replies, proceed, delay, or deny. And proceed is pretty self-explanatory. There was nothing that popped up that was a problem. Delay may pop up, pop up because when we're doing the background check, we may discover that oh, something's not quite right here, or, or we didn't get a return. Maybe the information they provided is not showing a valid a valid return, you know, something is not quite right, which requires further investigation to find out if, if it is valid or if there is a problem. Competing interests, again. Under Washington, under federal law, if you can't find a reason to deny it, you must approve it within three days. Under Washington law, if you cannot find a reason to deny it, you must approve it within 10 days. So if, if law enforcement is super busy and super inundated, if after 10 days we can't find a reason to deny it, it has to be approved. It doesn't mean that the dealer can't opt out on his own if, if the law enforcement says, you know, something's not quite right, I can't tell you to deny it, but the dealer himself could opt out, and that does occasionally happen, although if something's not quite right here, we're not going to sell this firearm. So that, that is an option that occurs as well. Part of the new law also requires that people who are purchasing firearms um, provide a certificate of training, that they have been to some training. And that the training is, you know, the way that they've, they've worded the law, we'll pull that up right now, so it's <coughs> exactly what it says, 41090. The training requires basic firearms safety skills, essentially covering the, the firearm safety rules. Also it covers suicide prevention and talking about firearms use in, in suicides. And that has been a, a big issue because according to the 2017 stats, there were 23,000 um, suicides by firearms in the United States. So that issue was addressed in the new laws. The, the training, um, proof of training is valid for five years. Another aspect that was added is the waiting period. Um, for semi-automatic uh, rifles, there is a 10-day waiting period um, for the transfer. Um, and again, if it cannot be denied within 10 days, it must be approved. So it puts, it shifts a, a burden upon local law enforcement, regardless of their workload, um, 
for these background checks. The new law also created um, a requirement for storage. So if you have a firearm, you must store your firearm in a secure way with a either a gun locker or a trigger lock. And if you don't do that and something bad happens with your firearm and you don't report it, then you're potentially criminally liable and civilly liable for what occurs. So the, the this this law is is designed to control the firearms more, and you know there's lots of lots and lots of stolen firearms that are used in crimes that aren't always reported, you know, or, or maybe they weren't reported in a timely manner. So this law is is hoping to uh, kind of control that a little bit, so that law enforcement will know in a very quick manner if something has been stolen. Um, it also is designed to encourage parents who have firearms in their home to control those, especially um, if there are problems in the home and, and problems with mental health. And, and we've seen that nationally in uh, some active shooter events where uh, I look at Sandy Hook in New Jersey as one specifically where a you know, he took a firearm from the home and then went to the, the school. And so that this law would have addressed that issue after the fact. It does nothing to prevent those things from happening other than to provide some sort of hook for the parents to control the firearms. Another uh, responsibility that has been switched to local law enforcement, and this is not, it's in effect, but there isn't really a mechanism to do this yet. Um, this, the I-1639 uh, created the responsibility on law enforcement to annually verify eligibility for people who have firearms in their jurisdiction. I'm not sure how that can happen. Because I mean, are you going to run criminal background checks on every person who lives within your jurisdiction to ensure that they can lawfully possess a firearm? So this is one of those instances where, you know, meaning well, but the practicality of it and the application of it is practically impossible. Um, but that, that is something that the, the law wanted to happen. I don't know how that can happen, though, to be very honest with you. Uh, but also applied for a $25 fee um, for the to cover some of the background checks, and there is a goal for the future to have a single point system, rather than going through local law enforcement and the feds to go to essentially almost like the Department of Licensing, and that has been one of the entities that has been discussed as uh, the single point where if, if you went to purchase a firearm, it would go directly to them and uh, they would approve or disapprove the, the firearm transfer. So those are some of the, n some of the new laws that occurred basically just from the, the recent um, initiative actions. There are some other things that, that occurred, not necessarily because of the initiative this year, but because of a law that was passed a, about a year and a half ago. And some of those were, uh, changes incurred, uh, included out-of-state purchasing. If you are a Washington resident, you can't go to another state and buy something to kind of circumvent the laws here. They essentially said you can't do that. Um, and you can only purchase a firearm out of state if that state is following the applicable federal laws. I have a question. Yes. So if I wanted to go to Tri-State, I couldn't go to Tri-State and purchase a new gun? You can go to Tri-State and purchase a new gun because Tri-State's following the applicable federal laws. So if they if they weren't, how would we know that? <laughs> Shouldn't know that. It would be a, if they weren't following the federal law, then it would be a federal law violation to purchase the firearm anyway. Um, but within the state of Washington, we would have no idea of knowing that. But you would have committed a felony somewhere else, a federal felony. Which doesn't knowing. license it, though, right? In Washington. So she'd still have to fill out a form. You, you are not required to license a firearm in the state of Washington. 
What you're required to do is, if, if you make a purchase of a firearm or a transfer of a firearm, you're required to fill out the ATF application to ensure that you are lawful to possess it. And again, you go back to the 1986 Gun Control Act, which said that government can't keep a list. So the idea of licensing the firearms would be violating the 1986 Gun Control Act. So if, if my firearm is going to be licensed and you're going to keep it on a registry, now there are other places that have licensing in place or a version of licensing. The Supreme Court has not addressed that in a, in a meaningful way. They pretty much have, have said you can't <laughs> outlaw specifically, but they didn't say at a federal level, well, no, you can't make someone uh, go onto a list. So that, that's one of the things that the Supreme Court may be looking at in 2020, is whether or not they can actually require a, a list or keep a list. So that, that is a pretty hot, hot button issue um, regarding you know, keeping firearm registries and lists of gun owners and et cetera. That's, that's a, a big issue nationally. So is transferring when it's only for the licensing is, land, is the, like, what if you get a firearm from an estate, but it's probably some old firearm that is There's, a, there's not. a law for that now. Okay. So last year, um, they passed a law, and I'll look up the specific dates on that here. If you receive a firearm as an inheritance, find where that one is. It is, I believe you have 60 days to um, fill out the transfer because in Washington, so it's still a transfer. It's a transfer. It's not there. But, but it might not be licensed to begin with. Well, it's it's not licensed, but any time the possession of a firearm is transferred <coughs> from one owner or from the estate transfer. to another owner. Under Washington law, there now has to be a, a essentially a paper trail to show the transfer, and the person who is now accepting ownership of that firearm can lawfully possess it. They can't maintain a registry, though. So when did that go into Last effect? year. I was before that. <laughs> it's like, oh, well. So, so yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the, the firearm laws are pretty complex. And again, it goes back to these competing interests. There are you know, goals for safety in society, and then there is you know, a, a push for the Second Amendment, a right to own and possess <coughs> firearms. And where, where do you restrict and what is a right? And how much can you restrict under that right? And again, the, the, the law of the land is what the Supreme Court says. And the Supreme Court hasn't really answered those questions. So can I so, so it's moved away from weapons, so now it's on people and eligibility. So starting in July, you all have to process those background checks. And then do you keep a log of who's come in for verification? There, we then just set a like a year timer to then you go back and rerun that every year. So, so that would be the way that you would do it. So, so there are some some issues with that, and that federally, in order to use a law enforcement database to run criminal history on people, um, there are, there's there's if you have to do it for a law enforcement purpose. Well, if you just run someone to see if they can still possess a firearm. I would argue that that's probably what we operate through what's called access. And uh, access is, is the portal that Washington uses to get into the national firearms, or, or excuse me, the national criminal databases. And there's, there's some conflict there. Um, that, that has not been sorted out, is what is lawful as far as running random checks on people would be random or would it be yearly? Well, yearly or if, if, if you don't do it randomly, you say I'm going to do it at a prescribed time just to run that person. I, state law is saying yes, do that. Is that going to be a constitutional argument that, that you can't do that? Would, would keeping that information constitute a list of people that have registered firearms I, as well? I, I think that you probably would be there. I'm not an attorney, nor have I argued before the state Supreme Court. <laughs> but I think that, 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 that you, you run a real risk of that. And there's, there's a lot of attorneys out there that would probably argue that. 
does sound like if you want a firearm, you need an attorney first. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's growing very complicated. Can I ask another question? Yes. So if I, um, so the training, it only talks about the semi-automatic assault rifle. So if I wanted a new pistol, I don't have to have training? It didn't specifically cover that on pistols. I just bought one today. Oh, okay. Just bought one today. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, I'm going to go over this from my list real quick here and make sure I didn't miss any very specific laws that are going to affect us because we've covered the storage. Okay, this is a new law that went into effect that um, it's called the Extreme Risk Protection Order. And this is not a firearms law, except it uh, affects. Uh, firearms in, in, in regard to public safety. So an extreme risk protection order is a law that went into place that essentially allows anyone, including law enforcement, to file a petition with the court to say that this person is mentally unstable and they present an imminent danger to the community. So upon uh, the court receiving that information, the court will make a judgment based upon the petition and decide, yes, I'm going to take the, make a ruling that the firearms can be taken away from that person. And this extreme risk protection order, once it is ruled, and we actually have done it in Pullman, have we done two of them now? I know of one for sure, I'm not sure about the I, I'm pretty sure we did two of them. We did, yeah, we've done oh, two. Oh, we did, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the, the most recent one, without going into great detail, there was an individual who had been suffering from some a mental health crisis and we had dealt with that person several times to the point where we even he was he was definitely suicidal we were able to intervene and prevent that from happening this individual showed up at a big concert in the gorge um, over the summer with a whole bunch of firearms and ammunition at this giant at this concert and he went there and his he was stopped by the sheriff's department there. The information came back to us about what had happened. And so we did the extreme risk protection order to make sure that, because he was a, he lived in Pullman. And this was right before Lentil Festival was occurring and he was essentially having his mental health crisis then. And so we intervened and to ensure that he wouldn't be have possession of his firearms at that time. So that is a direct application of a new law that has occurred. So it, 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 it stands, uh, if it stands up to the courts, it could be a very useful tool for, you know, public safety. Um, in terms of like a judgment like that, does it have an automatic time limit? Does it have no time limit? What? There are some, there are some specific law, um, restrictions in here. So, well, I didn't pull up that section of it, but <laughs> okay, recalling from memory, um, when the order is served, the person has the right to have a hearing um, I believe it's within 15 days, um, and once they have the hearing, um, the judge will make a more long-term decision. Um, he can delay it out again, and I want to say 60 days, but that may not be accurate. He can delay it out <coughs> again, um, and the the person, you know, has a right to have an attorney to represent them in these hearings to um, restore the the rights to possess the firearms, potentially. And I think that the a uh, person who files that, it has to either be a family member or law enforcement. No. But a, so is, that's a civil process, so they wouldn't be it's a civil process for a public defender or a public an attorney. They essentially have to pay for the attorney themselves. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would, the only time it would become a crime is if they refuse to follow the order. Then it would be a court order violation, which would be a, a criminal act. So if you ever heard the term red flag law, that's essentially what that is. Some of the other changes that occurred um, for dealers. Um, dealers are required to post information, um, and they have a very uh, specific uh, words that they're supposed to post anywhere that they sell firearms. So if you go to Walmart, you'll see this posted, and it says, this is the exact warning they have to post. You may face criminal prosecution if you store or leave an unsecured firearm where a person who is prohibited from possessing a firearm can and does obtain the weapon. So if you see that posted anywhere, that's specifically mandated by Washington law that that, that warning is posted. 
Um, dealers are also uh, under a little bit more uh, constraints as far as, let's see, here we go. As, as far as is issuing the firearms, and they, they face more penalties if they were to you know sell a firearm to somebody who was ineligible. Um, they were already prohibited from doing that under federal law, which potentially would be more uh, punitive than state law anyway. Um, but now there is a Washington law that covers the same area. So those that's a, a brief overview of of the kind of the, the where we're at law wise. There are many other laws and other details out there, but I think this is probably a good um, overview of the highlights that what may affect people and what some of the changes are. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Yes. Could you explain why WSU police can no longer house student weapons? And how that affects us um, from this law? I think you would have to refer to WSU administration on that. I think their reasoning is, is that once they take possession of the weapon to give the weapon back, they have to go through this whole process of the background check and everything before they can release it to someone before to determine if they're eligible to possess it. So it, it adds a lot more complexity than just taking the firearm and giving it back. So, so the, the kind of to expand upon that, I didn't go into great detail on that particular law. On firearm transfers, if I as an individual wanted to sell a firearm to you now, previously, I could say, give me the money, here's the gun. Under the way that the law is written in Washington now, we have to go to a dealer. And I will pay this dealer um, a firearms transfer fee, and that dealer will then run the background check as if it was a gun you were buying from that dealer. And then the firearm, so you have this third party, the gun goes from me to him to you. And so it has a background check. That is a requirement for any firearm transfer. So person-to-person -person transfers <coughs> are unlawful. Unless, and there's a bunch of exceptions. And, <laughs> and these exceptions are, you know, if you're giving somebody a firearm to uh, defend themselves um, in a imminent way, um, if you're participating in hunting activities, if it's, a, if it's a, a family member, a spouse, a child, an uncle, an aunt, I mean, some of these close, close relationships, you can transfer a firearm directly to them, um, but to anyone else, it must go through this third-party dealer and have a, a background check conducted. So those exceptions, do they apply to, so selling a firearm to a, like a close family member, for example, or just giving it to them while you when the, when climb they, over the fence, for example. <laughs> the law doesn't differentiate if you if, if you sell it or give it. It's okay. still a transfer. Okay. So the so even if there's not a third party, those two are responsible for completing the application process during so, any transfer, even so, if it's like within a family. So so if 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 you were to give a gun to your wife. For Christmas, yeah, you don't have to do that. That's an exception. Oh. Okay. But to buy it, right? You would you'd be authorized. To, to no, they don't differentiate between buying or giving. It's just considered a transfer. Okay. Um, what about having a, a firearm in in your vehicle? Say, say, um, say a couple. One has a concealed weapons permit and he has it you know say in the car or the truck and then he's in the house and say the wife drives the car and it's still in the car so in order to carry a loaded pistol in a vehicle in Washington you have to have a concealed pistol license and if the husband and we'll use that in an example in this case has a concealed pistol license and carries the loaded pistol in the vehicle that is lawful if he leaves the vehicle and now the wife is driving the vehicle and does not have a CPL and it's still in the vehicle, that is a law violation. You know, and is it would it be prosecuted uh, given the circumstances? I cannot say that, but it is a technical law violation. <coughs> does it have to be loaded? So if you took your bur you took your. If it's unloaded, then it's not a. 
doesn't qualify. Like anywhere? Is that like not just in a vehicle? Because I can take my barrel out of my pistols and it's well, usually if you, like my barrels in my pistol or my pocket, my pistol. Well, what the law says is carrying a loaded pistol. So if you to remove the ammunition from it, um, then it would and, and put it in a. You know, there's there's arguments that well, you know, there's no round in the chamber, but there's a magazine in it. That's a loaded pistol. There's still ammunition contained within the firearm, versus removing the magazine and you know putting the magazine in the trunk, but the or in the glove box and the guns in the trunk, then it's not a, carrying a loaded pistol in the vehicle. You're also not allowed to have um, a pistol be in view from the outside while carrying it in a vehicle if it's unattended. So you, if you were to leave uh, your pistol sitting on the seat and go in the house, um, that, that's or go into a store, that's a violation. And so how then does that tie in, say, with storage requirements? Because if you leave your gun in a vehicle and then you go somewhere, it seems like you might have, need to have a lock then, right? Yes. Okay. And locking in the vehicle probably doesn't qualify, right? <laughs> uh, it depends on uh, probably the circumstances and the attorney, etc. <laughs> because they, they, they have said that they want it to be secured and using uh, you know, trigger locks and gun cases and those kinds of things. Yeah. But it doesn't strictly prohibit just having it locked in the vehicle. It doesn't specifically <laughs> address that. And what what I have have seen in a lot of initiative laws that go into place, sometimes the laws are not written as carefully <laughs> as they would be if they had gone through the legislature where there is a lot of input and a lot of attorneys dealing with it. Um, sometimes on initiatives, they're, they have a very specific goal in mind, and maybe they're not covering all of the, the legal aspects that, that could be considered. Yeah. <clears throat> so practically speaking, Chief, are you tracking how many, so maybe not the people, but the number of checks that you do? Yes. you keep a record of those? Yeah. And there's a discussion um, with WASPIC to talk about uh, Waspik is going to make a recommendation about how to handle them state, statewide. Uh, I think the goal is to try to have a one, um, one source to do all of those checks, whether it's Washington State Patrol or Department of Licensing or Waspik, rather than having it all on the law enforcement agencies. So going back to the um, storage with the students, I haven't heard of any issues of students having them in student housing, but has anything come up? Based upon my experience, there have been no problems. And I'll, I'll qualify that um, I work graveyard shift, and so that's from 10 at night till 7 in the morning. And on my last shift um, on Saturday night into Sunday morning, I heard WSU Police Department do several gun checks for people to go out hunting early in the morning. So apparently they are still doing some of them. Because I heard that because they pull a case when they do it to document that they released a firearm back to someone. So they are still doing it. Whether they're supposed to be or not, I don't know. But they, they are doing it. So, um, one last thing I kind of wanted to touch on before we go, and it's kind of to, to talk a little bit about the, the fear factor. So a lot of the, the initiative type laws and some of the non-initiative type laws that are uh, aimed at restricting, controlling firearms, access to firearms, um, et cetera, a lot of that is pushed out of you know, public safety and fear. People don't want to be harmed. They don't want their family to be harmed. There is a fear. And, and you can't tell someone not to be afraid. People just are going to be afraid. That's, that's just reality. But before I left, I wanted to hit a couple stats for you to consider. So in 2017, gun deaths nationally, there were 39,773 gun deaths. 60% of those deaths were suicides, and the remaining 40% were homicides, self-defense, negligent shootings, etc., accidents things like that. So total number of gun deaths um, 
39,000. So, and there has been some fear regarding firearms. At the same token, um, according to the, the stat that I just uh, located from the CDC, there were 647,000 people that died from heart disease in the same year. McDonald's should be scarier than guns. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just a, a stat to consider. I, I can't say don't be afraid because McDonald's is not going to come to your school and shove a hamburger in your mouth. So that's just something to keep in mind that, you know, you, the, the odds and the percentages and the, the fear that people feel, you know, you have to look at the statistics and see what is, what's, what is reality. So 39,000, is that national or? That's nationally. And, and of that, 14,000 were homicides, negligent shootings, reckless shootings, and things like that. That, that's, that's including uh, the cases from the larger cities, Chicago, New York, D.C., that have a, a very big homicide problem. Anything else I can hopefully answer for you guys? Um, I got my permit a few years ago, so I was just going to ask you to update me on some information. Um, are you obligated to tell the officer when you get pulled over, when they ask, or before? In the state of Washington, you are not obligated to tell the police officer that you're armed. Right. Um, I am aware that there are states that do require that. Um, Alaska is a state that does require it. Alaska doesn't require that you carry a concealed pistol license, but it is against the law for you not to tell a police officer that um, you're carrying a firearm. And is there any like fee requirement away from school, say if I'm driving? So or if, if, if you are in uh, a, what's a considered a gun free safety zone, which includes schools, if you are just driving through the area, the law allows for you to drive through the area. If you are stopping in the parking lot to pick up your child from school, it allows you to stop in the parking lot to pick up your <coughs> child from school. You cannot carry it onto the school grounds, though. Oh. Thank you. Um, when it comes to storage, one thing just clarifying, so say the homeowner has guns in their house. So um, it sounds like the reporting to law enforcement in five days of a theft, is that if you don't have it locked or you're required to have it locked anyway, you cut it, and you also have to well, report it to five. So, so if, if someone comes in and uh, uses a cutting torch and cuts open your gun safe and steals your guns out of it, yeah, you did everything you possibly could as long as you report it within five days. Okay, okay. And you put trigger locks, they can still walk off with it, but as long as you report it within five days, you're good. Yes. Okay. But if you didn't have it locked and somebody... You know, if he came over and potentially stole criminally and civilly liable. Even yeah, if I reported in five days. So, so if if you report it within five days, but you did not have it secure, you are still potentially criminally liable. So we'll go. I'll, I'll hit that law real quickly here in a little bit more detail. I have that one. Okay. So unsafe storage of a firearm. A person who stores or leaves a firearm in a location where the person knows or reasonably should know that a prohibited person may gain access to the firearm is guilty of community endangerment due to unsafe storage of a firearm in the first degree if a prohibited person obtains access to the firearm and causes injury or death with the firearm. And that's a Class C felony. You're guilty of community endangerment in a misdemeanor way if the person obtains the firearm who is prohibited and causes the firearm to be discharged or ex exhibits, displays the firearm in a public place in a manner that either manifests the intent to intimidate or warrants alarm. So you potentially you know, could be guilty of a felony if someone steals your firearm and uses it to do evil. And even if they don't do evil, if they just take the firearm and they uh, take it to school and show their friends, uh, that's a misdemeanor if you had leave it in an unsafe place knowing that somebody could have access to it. And so unsafe place just means? 
Well, outside of a gun safe. So, so the way that they're defining it here is where the person knows or reasonably should know that a prohibited person may gain access to the firearm. So from extremes, if you leave it sitting on the kitchen counter, that's a reasonable person would know someone could gain access to it versus if you put it in your gun safe is the other extreme. It's locked inside your gun safe. Now, we have not prosecuted anyone in Pullman under this new law, and I am not aware of any um, Washington prosecutions to this new law yet either. So a lot of the details end up being worked out through case law where a judge somewhere will decide, no, that was not reasonable, um, this is reasonable, etc. <laughs> we just recommend not being the, the test case. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you still have gun locks available? Yes, we do. Yeah. The, the police department has free gun locks. You just stop by the and hand them out. How do you prove that you had one on there, though? I mean, if somebody's going to steal my gun, they're obviously going to break the gun lock. Well, it's, it's like any other crime, you know, the, we would investigate and we may not arrive at probable cause. Um, the, this law also has some civil penalties. And, <coughs> you know, in a civil court, the, the level of, of evidence is much lower. You know, if you considered uh, in a civil court, generally, it's the preponderance of evidence. You know, more likely than not that this occurred, they could rule against you. <laughs> Sounds like the best thing is just to get a gun safe and put everything in it. <laughs> Probably, and have a gun lock on them in the gun safe. It, it, yes, and, and in so Washington, you can't prove that it was in there when they stole it, though. We're still screwed. <laughs> and, the, the, you know, the being reasonable, I think kind of the, that, that term gets looked over. You know, if you're reasonable, you know, it goes a long ways. Reasonable common sense. Common sense isn't as common as it used to be, but reasonable common sense, you know, governs a lot of this. <laughs> for people that have them for um, self-defense or personal safety at home, they make some pretty advanced gun safes now where you can just open it with your fingerprint. Hmm. I have a five-year-old at home. And I have lots of firearms, um, and I don't leave them out. I have I have three gun safes, and so they're so a couple of them are very quick access, like the chief is talking about, uh, because my fear is not someone breaking into my house and stealing my firearms. It's my five-year-old going, "Ooh, I'm going to play with Dad's gun." <laughs> that is my fear. Which happened on our previous street that we lived on. To a sheriff. To a sheriff's office, yeah. And what about the free gun safe thing? What? We have free gun locks at the police free department. Free gun locks yes. for the for the gun itself. The trigger. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Are they universal? Do they fit all triggers? They are a, a lock with a chain on it that is about, oh, the chain's probably 10 or 12 inches long. And so you can take the chain and loop it through the magazine well or loop it, loop it through the, the bolt in some way so that it can't be closed. And operable. Is there a way to ensure, like, a foreign born resident doesn't have felony in another country, such as working with Interpol or anything like that? You know, when they do those checks, I believe they hit Interpol, don't they? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions from you? Thank you very much for coming and talking to us today. Thank you. That's good information. Next up. Thanks, sir. Chief Jenkins with our police department update. All right. Well, we've been uh, helping to some musical chairs at the police department lately. There's <laughs> some changes that we've had. So first of all, uh, Commander Chris Tenek retired September 30th. Um, he went on a two-week Alaska vacation, and I guess he thought that two weeks being off work was pretty nice because he came back and gave his notes. Wow. <laughs> so uh, we, we actually have now two commander positions. I had not yet filled the second commander position. So I uh, promoted Sergeant Jake Gopkin North to commander to replace Chris Tennant. Um, I don't have anyone left in-house that's qualified uh, to be uh, a commander, so we'll be doing a recruitment uh, process and an assessment center for a uh, commander from outside the department. 
So to replace Jake Opkin North as sergeant, uh, just today uh, promoted Chris uh, Engel to sergeant. He was the next person on our sergeant list. And so he, he was a detective. He'll go now to patrol as a sergeant. So to replace him and detectives, we are moving Officer TJ Cornish from patrol to detectives. And then uh, at the end of this year, uh, Detective Heidi Lamley, her time in detectives is up. She'll go back to patrol. And then Officer Mike Sontgraff will go into detectives January 1st. Uh, Officer Ashley Lamb just completed her field training with us. And so she's now out on her own. And Officer Brianna Banks uh, has about one more week in field training, and then she'll be out on her own. Officer Kayla Nuxall is in the police academy and will gradu graduate December 13th. So that leaves us, uh, we still have four to hire, four vacancies to fill. So we just did a recruitment and had in, uh, panel interviews. Uh, Kenitra um, Kini sat on the panel representing the Police Advisory Committee. And uh, those applicants now are going through uh, chief's interviews and then uh, those that passed chief interview to background. Uh, we won't get enough from this list to fill all four vacancies, so we already have a recruitment going again, and we'll probably do interviews around December. Uh, and so if don't we don't fill all our four by then, we'll do another recruitment process. Those four, does that include the commander position? Um, the command, no, the commander is well, no, one. commander is separate. <laughs> separate, okay. Separate, okay. Yeah. So I have four officers plus a okay. okay. Um, our record specialist positions are now fully staffed. We have two people that we recently hired. Uh, Amanda Nickerson started August 13th, and Bridget LaSalle started September 10th. So they're both in training. Uh, they'll be in training for two or three months, and then they'll be out on their own, and we'll be fully staffed in records. We just signed an agreement with WSU Criminal Justice and Dr. Macon with the fellowship program where uh, it's a three-year agreement for a doctoral student to provide um, essentially assistance to us with analysis and uh, research. And uh, Megan Parks is the student, and she's already started on a project. We, uh, the city hired a consultant to do a study to determine if we could establish our own municipal court rather than be dependent on uh, district court. And so um, Megan is assisting that consultant in that process. Um, the Hargraves trial ended in a mistrial, and the prosecuting attorney decided not to retry. Uh, the main consideration was that the victim did not want to go through another trial. So what happens now is if um, if he had been convicted of a felony, his law enforcement certification would have been revoked immediately on that conviction. So <coughs> the Criminal Justice Training Commission had that case on hold to see what happened in the criminal trial. So now that that's completed, they will start a process to decertify him. And um, so they will collect all the information and make a determination whether they feel that it should be revoked, and then they'll serve him with uh, that notice and he uh, has a certain amount of time to respond to that notice uh, to ask for a hearing. If he doesn't ask for a hearing, they will just decertify him. If he asks for a hearing, they will hold a hearing and then make a determination. Today I attended a meeting in Colfax uh, on the topic of <coughs> suicide. Um, it's been alarming the number of suicides we've seen in Whitman County in the last few years. And it seems to be increasing as well as uh, attempted suicide and threatened suicide. And so uh, the county coroner was there, uh, the sheriff was there, I was there, Pullman Fire. We had people from school districts there as well and WSU Mental Health and Student Services. And so uh, essentially it was a step, stepping off point to, to work together to talk about what we can all do with um, suicide prevention and also providing care for families um, after there is a suicide and then also follow up with those who have attempted or have threatened suicide. 
So um, Annie Pillars, who's the county coroner, is, is heading that up. And um, so I think it'll be a good collaborative effort. We'll see what we can come up with. The city is, uh, we've probably told you before, the city is upgrading their website. We, uh, they have uh, the uh, temporary site probably up and running, and we're working now on trying to uh, figure out what content we want to keep and what we need to update and that type of thing. And so uh, you'll see something uh, come out, I think, pretty soon of, with the announcement of the new website. So what I would ask this group to do is once we make that announcement, we'll let you know and then provide us some feedback uh, about how you feel about the navigation and maybe how things uh, look on there and if you have suggestions for changes or things that are missing or things that are really hard to find, um, let us know because we want to try to make it as user-friendly as possible. But it's going to be so much better than the current website. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> And so I don't know if you want to talk about future presentations at the um, this meeting right now about what uh, we want to do. Some of the things that we have on our list. One was to talk about red light cameras. And Dr. Macon and I talked about this a little bit. And I think um, uh, Megan can do some research for us and come <coughs> come here and present uh, what she's found as far as some pros and cons and, and some uh, real life uh, results. So I would asked maybe to put that off until she's available after we're done with the municipal court study and yeah we finish yeah. that then she can come in yeah i think so, if she like would sit down to like maine and grand just for a day she'd probably count like i don't know 50. <laughs> 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 oh, not kidding <laughs> interesting exercise <laughs> so some of the other things on the list uh, are wsupd to come in and talk about uh, their department and working with with us uh, code enforcement to talk about their work, active shooter training for civilians and police response, and then bob, bomb recognition and response. So that's what was on our list. And I also sent that um, the project manager for BDS right. for the yeah. mass, the downtown. And that's going to be dependent plan. on when they can. Come, yeah, right? trying. Because they're coming back in December and February, and so I'm, I asked her to let me know as soon as possible. Okay. Well, if you want, we can maybe tentatively schedule something for, no, well, they're not coming in November, so we need to figure out November. Right? Code enforcement? That'd be interesting. Right before it snows. That's what I'm thinking. Right before it snows, before yeah, that's we true. have. Well, it's already snowed, so. <laughs> <laughs> so about two months, right? So we, we still need an August? No, no, we just had August. So what's the other one? We need a June snow. <laughs> every month in Pullman will be covered because we had July. Well, we've, had, just, we've had snow in June before. We have, so there's, we've had all the months now? We've <laughs> had snow in July and August before. Here, yeah. yeah, we just had August, and then July would have been. Wait, what, we didn't have August. When did we have August? We had September. And September, October. so it's so it's yeah, it's August. Did, have we had snow in August before? Yeah, I don't know about August, but uh, August is the only month I don't know that we've had snow. Yeah. So yes, code enforcement. <laughs> code enforcement <laughs> for next month. <laughs> I'm, yeah. Hell, I'm, I'm interested, right? For Christmas and lights. And <laughs> Exciting things going on in code enforcement too. So. In the Cayo. Or exactly. coyote depends on where you're from. <laughs> but, uh, I see that thing at least well. You say once a week we see them. Or, or we don't know. We're just we definitely generating. It's a hint. It's just all... hungry looking for cats. I mean, come on, <laughs> they need to eat too. <laughs> I've noticed that there's not a lot of stray cats. We haven't noticed a lot of those, so I don't. Yeah. It does help with the feral cat population. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No. Um, so, constituencies poll. Got anything to talk about? Uh, the, uh, you already touched on the trial. That's where all my students and everyone want to know more about. So, that's a good update. Yeah, and just, just as a reminder, and because I, um, I don't know how, uh, how much of this is out in the public, but um, before, well, after the arrest, we wait for the criminal investigation to be done before we do an internal investigation. So we started an internal investigation, and then uh, we called him 
to come in and be interviewed. So in a criminal case, defendants have the they don't they have the right not to incriminate themselves, right? They don't have to give a statement. But in um, in employment circumstance, uh, he's he's obligated to give us a statement. So we had an interview set up, and essentially he he resigned the day before he was to give that interview. So he resigned in lieu of termination. So he hasn't worked for us since that time, which has been quite a while. And he, he's not, he will not get his job back. Um, and then, as I just explained, we're working on the decertification, which that's entered into a national decertification database that's available to law enforcement nationwide. for the GPSA. Nothing to report. I don't have anything for Sunnyside. I don't have anything. I don't have anything either. Nothing for me. Either. You guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done yet. The track don't go away. <laughs> we the city is under such control. <laughs> yes. Our public comment left. Um, so we have no public comment anymore. Uh, November 4th is going to be our next meeting since the 11th is a holiday. So mark that on your calendars to change it from the 11th to the 4th. The first Monday of the month. Yes. And Ms. Darby, will you send an email reminder to yes. everyone? <clears throat> Anything else? I'm not going to turn this. We're out of here. <laughs>